Hello everyone and welcome to the ninth and final video in the FINA 5000 DCF tutorial series. My name is Harrison Ham, and in this video we're going to be making our own adjustments to the DCF model so that we get a more accurate representation of our company's implied share prices. So up until now everything you've done has been working towards getting the model into working condition. But the problem is that there's no one DCF model that's going to be perfect for all the companies in the world. Every company is different, so you need to sit there and think about all the assumptions you've used in your model and whether they need to be changed in order to get a more accurate representation of your company. Now obviously it's going to be really difficult for me to go through every single assumption in the spreadsheet with you guys because it would just take forever. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of things that I would change for Home Depot within this model so that you'll get an idea of what sort of things you might want to be looking for when you do your own analysis with your own company. So the first thing that I would change has to do with the assumed sales growth rate over the next year. So right now in the post-COVID world, there's been a huge housing boom. And Home Depot has really been benefiting from this because they sell a lot of home building products. Because of that, I think that the assumed historical sales growth rate might be a little bit too low. So instead, I'm going to put in a 10% growth rate over the next year because I think sales are going to grow a little bit faster than they have historically for this year. And then they're going to revert back to historical averages after that. So the first thing you need to do whenever you make a change like this to the spreadsheet is you need to right click on the cell that you made the change in and you need to add a new note and explain exactly why you made that change so that someone who's looking through the model later understands exactly why things are different compared to the base model. So this is an example of the kind of changes you can make to the model but whenever you make a change like this it's always good to support your change with historical data. So for example for this I may want to go back and look and say okay year over year in the last quarter Home Depot sales have grown about 10%. Therefore, I think that this whole next year, sales are going to be about 10% higher. And then you have an actual concrete number that you can base your change around instead of arbitrarily just saying, oh, I think sales are going to be 10% higher next year without having anything to support it. So realistically, you can make a change to any of the assumptions here on the free cash flow tab if you think it's warranted. So for example, if you're making a pitch that Home Depot is going to be expanding its EBIT margins, then you definitely need to incorporate that in your DCF model. If you're saying, oh, their margins are going to be 15% after this year because of increased efficiency or something like that, and you don't incorporate that in your model, well, that's just silly. So make sure you make those changes if you need to. Another area that you can look to change things on the free cash flow tab is up here in the assumptions. For example, for Home Depot, I may change the effective tax rate. And the reason for doing that is if we go over here to the income statement and we come down to where we calculated the effective tax rate, we're using the five-year average of the effective tax rate as our number. But if you look at it, Five and four years ago, the effective tax rate was around 37%, but the last three years just dropped down to 24%. If I were to go and do a little research, I would quickly find that there was a cut in the actual corporate tax rate back in 2017. So it would actually make a lot more sense for us to use the effective tax rate from the last three years, because it's gonna be a more accurate representation of Home Depot's tax rate going forward. So remember, now that we made this change, we need to right click the cell and add a new note and explain why we made the change. So now that we have our note, we can go back over here to the free cash flow tab and we'll see that the effective tax rate already changed itself because we linked the assumptions over properly. So now it should incorporate itself into our model. So you can also make changes to the other tabs of the DCF model. For example, in the networking capital tab, all of these balance sheet items are assumed to be a set percentage of sales going forward. However, if we look at the percentages historically, we may end up finding some trends in the numbers. For example, if we look at accounts payable, we see that historically over the five to one year ago range, it was around 7%. Then last year, it jumped significantly up to around 9%. So looking at that, I think, okay, maybe Home Depot had some sort of change in their policies as to how they pay off their accounts payable. So I went and did a little research and I quickly realized that, oh, the change in accounts payable is likely due to changes in laws around paying off liabilities if you're a corporate entity like Home Depot. So because of that, I don't think this is a trend that we need to adjust for going forward because now we're in the post-COVID world and those changes in laws are likely to reverse back very soon. So because of that, you have to keep in mind that even if there's a trend in the numbers, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to make a change. Again, every single trend tells a story. And if you don't understand that story, then you don't know if you need to make a change going forward or not. Moving over to the WAC tab, there's a couple things you may want to change. You might want to change the risk-free rate if you end up projecting a different period length than five years. For example, if you're projecting 10 years, you may want to switch to a 7 or 10 year bond instead. Uh, in terms of beta, FactSet uses a 3 year beta. So if your company was recently involved in a merger, say a year ago, then you might want to use a 1 year beta instead because 3 years ago they were a completely different company from the one they are today. So it's likely that their beta is going to be very different. The same goes for all the assumptions on this tab. If there's anything that you want to change, make sure that it's justified before you make the change. 
but then feel free to do so and add a note explaining why you made the change. Finally, moving over to the comps tab, it couldn't hurt to go back through and make sure that all the comps you choose are actually appropriate because the comps that you choose are one of the most important things that you pick in this model. The reason being that you use your comps to calculate your terminal multiple, which is one of the most important inputs that you have in calculating your second implied share price. In order to better analyze if my comps are appropriate for Home Depot, I'm going to create a graph of their current EV to EBITDA ratios to see how they stack up against each other. So to insert our graph, we're going to select all the way from the ticker names over to the EV to EBITDA ratio. We're going to come up here to insert. We're going to insert a 2D column. But you'll see that it included the fiscal period as part of the names for each of these bars, which is not something that we want. So we're going to come up here and do select data. And then we're going to edit the horizontal category. And we're going to change this over to F. That way it only includes the tickers. And then now I'm going to do a little more formatting to make our table look a little bit neater. So now that I have it formatted, I'm going to move it down here so it's out of the way. And we can see from this chart that Home Depot has a pretty high EV to EBITDA ratio compared to its competitors which suggests that we might need to adjust our terminal multiple in order to account for the fact that Home Depot trades at a higher multiple than its competitors. So keep in mind that the terminal multiple is one of the most important things that you'll choose in this entire model. So you need a really sound justification if you're going to make any changes to it. For example, Home Depot may have a high EV to EBITDA ratio right now compared to its competitors, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to have a high EV to EBITDA ratio in five years. Using Home Depot as an example, I wanted to see if I was justified in increasing the terminal multiple in our analysis. So I looked at historical EV to EBITDA ratios for Home Depot and all of its competitors. Here I have highlighted in yellow the highest EV to EBITDA ratio in each year. As you can see, Home Depot has the highest ratio in every year except for 2017, where it tied with tractor supply for the highest ratio. Because of this, it's pretty reasonable to say that Home Depot is going to have a higher EV to EBITDA ratio than its competitors whenever it gets to its terminal year. So because of this, we need to make some sort of an adjustment to adjust for the fact that Home Depot traditionally trades at a higher ratio. So the question is, what exactly do you now use as the new EV to EBITDA ratio since you know Home Depot is supposed to trade at a higher multiple than its competitors? Well, I believe in the instructions I say to use the average of the current median competitor's EV to EBITDA ratio and Home Depot's current ratio. But since I have all this historical data here, I'm going to go ahead and show you all a different method that you might use. So I've already calculated the median EV to EBITDA ratio in each year, and I've also calculated how Home Depot's EV to EBITDA ratio stacks up compared to the median as a percentage over the median. So it's basically Home Depot's ratio divided by the median's minus one. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the five-year average of these ratios, and we will assume that Home Depot is gonna be at a 38% premium compared to its competitors in terms of the EV to EBITDA ratio in the final year. But first, I'm going to go ahead and label all this so I know what I'm looking at later. So now that I have it all properly formatted, I'm going to take this entire table and I'm going to cut it. I'm going to put it right front and center on the free cash flow sheet. That way people aren't confused when they look to see why I changed the terminal multiple. So now when I make the change to terminal multiple, I'm going to multiply it by one plus this premium over its competitors. And that gives us a new terminal multiple of 15.4 times. So don't forget that we also need to put a note in this cell and explain exactly what's going on with this terminal multiple. This is probably going to end up being a pretty long note. So there we go. Now I have a note explaining exactly what's going on that references over to this table in case anybody's confused as to where I got the numbers for backing the terminal multiple that I'm using. So keep in mind that I'm backing this multiple with historical data, which makes it a lot easier to justify the decisions that I'm making as opposed to just willy-nilly deciding that I'm going to increase the ratio because Home Depot should trade at a higher EV to EBITDA. Also, keep in mind that if you change anything that has to do with the terminal multiple, the weighted average cost of capital, or the perpetuity growth rate, then you need to recopy these and paste values over here in the data tables because these are not linked. So they need to be manually updated by you. Otherwise, the data tables won't be representing the ratios and numbers that you ended up using in your model. Another thing I wanted to mention is that if you do want to change the perpetuity growth rate, don't change it to anything that's higher than historical GDP growth rates. And the reason for doing that is because if you do that, it implies that your company is going to eventually grow so large that it's going to encompass the entire U.S. economy and eventually the entire world, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So make sure that you look out for that if you do end up deciding to change it. So that concludes all the changes that I want to make to the Home Depot model. So if we scroll down here to our two implied pricing methods, we see that under the perpetuity growth method, we went from having a 3% premium to now about a 7.5% discount. There's a very similar story for the multiples method. We went from about a 20% premium to now having about a 14% discount, which just shows you how important it is that you actually do all your work 
and make sure that you know exactly what information is going into your company's model. So I hope that by watching the first eight videos in this series, y'all will be able to fill out the DCF model by starting with the blank template and working through it with your own companies. And I hope that by watching the ninth video, you'll have some idea of the type of changes that you can make for your company that will make your analysis a little more accurate so that you can get a better idea of your company's implied prices. My name is Harrison Hamm, and thank you all for watching this series of videos.